opportunity for you to join us and learn during your lunch hour. Um, the Athenaeum was founded with the idea of providing useful knowledge. And that is what we continue to try to share with all of our members and friends is useful knowledge, things that can affect us and how we think about the world around us. Um, and today's, today's topic will be one of those. If you are brand new to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia, this is your first time experiencing us. I hope you like what you see. Um, I hope you come in if you're, you live in the Philadelphia greater area and visit us and become a member um, and enjoy our circulating library, our regular programming of music and arts and um, lectures, speaker series small group events, our, our, our regular exhibits in our gallery, um, and the wonderful intellectual community that is so vibrant here. Um, do, go to our website, come in and see more about us. If you are a member, I want to remind you also that October is Member Appreciation Month. We're so glad uh, to all of you that are members and make the Athenaeum what it is. And we invite you whenever you come in, during the month of October, go to the front desk and you can enter your name into a raffle. Every week we're holding drawings for baskets that include treats to a bunch of different uh, cultural organizations in the city from um, Fringe Arts to Ballet X. Um, so don't forget to come in and, and get a, a ticket in that raffle. You can also get a little card that will allow you to bring um, a friend or a neighbor Three times you can bring someone to come and make use of the Athenaeum with you as well this month. And our member Monday later this month is going to be a special member appreciation month. Uh, member Monday, and you can bring a friend then as well. So there's so much going on, and I hope you will take part of all that we are doing. Today, I am delighted to... Uh, Give a shout out for one of our members, uh, Rebecca Yemen, and uh, she is giving our talk today. Uh, Rebecca is a Philadelphia-based historical archaeologist. As principal archaeologist and project manager for the John Milner Associates, Inc., she directed the analysis of 850,000 artifacts from the Five Point sites in Lower Manhattan and also directed numerous data recovery projects in Philadelphia, including the Independence Visitor Center and Liberty Bell Center sites on Independence Mall and the site of the Museum of the American Revolution on Third Street. Um, she's had a book come out about that. Her major publications include Digging in the City of Brotherly Love, Stories from Philadelphia Archaeology, first edition, which won the 2010 Society for American Archaeology Book Award and Archaeology at the Site of the American Revolution, A Tale of Two Taverns and the Growth of Philadelphia, which won the 2022 James Dietz Book Award from the Society for Historical Archaeology, and she holds an MA and PhD degrees from New York University and a bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of Philadelphia. Now, this book, Digging in the City of Brotherly Love, is available. Um, you could see when you registered, there was a code that you could use in a link to purchase the book. Tess Galen will also send you out after today's program an email. Look for that email. Open that email. There will be a link for buying the book with the 20% discount. Um, it's a beautiful new edition, paperback edition from Temple University Press, and I'm sure you'll want to get a copy for yourself. Holidays around the corner, that archaeology um, armchair lover that you know, here is a book that, and, and someone who loves Philadelphia history, here's the book for them. But right now, I want to turn it over to Rebecca and invite you. You have questions, you can put them in the chat or Q&A at any time. I will moderate those uh, after Rebecca finishes her, her talk. Thank you and welcome. And thank you so much for the introduction. So can you hear me now? Is this good? Okay, great. Okay, it's wonderful to be here. I'm thrilled to be able to talk about this second edition. I talked about the first edition at the Athenaeum in 2008. So here it's happening again, which is wonderful. I, I just wish I could see your faces. I'm looking at my own screen. So here we go. Uh, I thought I would start to talk about the difficulties of doing archaeology in the city by showing you some pictures of a project in New York. In, the, in fact, 
this project wasn't mentioned specifically in the introduction, but the one across the street was. In this case, uh, uh, we were just monitoring the construction of a tunnel under Pearl Street in Manhattan. So this is Pearl Street. The tunnel connected the Metropolitan Correction Center, which is this lovely red brick building where the 9-11 bombers were held to the Moynihan Courthouse across the street. And of course, in this picture, the Moynihan Courthouse hasn't been built yet. But this is the site that produced 850,000 artifacts associated with people who lived in the notorious Five Points neighborhood. So that was one of my very big projects. In fact, it's the project I started at John Milner Associates with, and we produced a six volume report in many publications. But I'm not gonna talk about that today. What I'm gonna talk about is this incredible tunnel fix, uh, project. So what we were looking for under Pearl Street, you know, they were digging, this tunnel so that they could take prisoners directly from the Metropolitan Correction Center into the courthouse once it, once it existed. The courthouse is now called the Moynihan Courthouse. And Moynihan came to see our artifacts. It was all very wonderful. The reason we were there is looking for the remains of an 18th century tanyard that had been, we knew had been located where Pearl Street now runs. So this is what the components of a tanyard from that period would be. And they were buried, um, what we found beneath Pearl Street was buried between 14 feet of utilities. Fortunately, we didn't have to do the digging here. So construction workers used, and here's one, you can see him among the, among the pipes, and construction workers used short shovels to weave through those lines to get to a depth where we could see whether there was anything left of the tan yard. Excuse me. And what we found were very fragmentary remains of the tanning vats, evidence of the manipulation of waterways used in the tanning process, lots of discarded cattle horns, a huge iron hook for moving skins around in the vats, and minuscule scraps of le leather. I, I mean, I hope you recognize, as I always remember, how extraordinary it is that there's anything left in lower Manhattan beneath 14 feet of utilities. But that's the miracle of urban archeology span that we really can find stuff where you wouldn't believe it possibly um, could have you know, stayed. In order to avoid disturbing daytime traffic on that project, they began at night. And so the site was lit up like a movie set and I had to be there between 7 p.m. and two in the morning. Happily, the contractor found that too difficult, which needless to say, I did too, and they moved it to daytime hours. And we worked under the plated street. You know what it sounds like when you drive over the plate over open construction. I can still hear that noise in my head from standing down there and making the, drawing the profile of the walls and finding what we found. <clears throat> And excuse me, a very different example of doing archaeology in the city is the burial ground that turned up during a construction of a commercial residential complex at 218 Arch Street in Philadelphia. And you may remember this incredible headline, old bones found and nobody's in charge. The problem here was that archaeology was not required by law. In Philadelphia, most of the large archeological projects are done in compliance with something called Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. And the reason that we have to comply with that act is if federal money is being used, either just to do the construction or if it's a federally owned site or a federal permit is required, that you are required to do something called cultural resource management, cultural resource studies. And that is, a, in terms of archaeology, it's a three-pronged process where first you determine whether what was there originally, then you see if, if there's any conceivability that there would be any remains of it there. In other words, how much uh, disturbance has happened since it was there in the 18th century or whenever. And then you have to completely dig it up if it's unavoidable, if they can't change the project. However, in this case, the, pro the, the building was being built with private money. So if it's only private money, they don't have to do archeology. span So they could dig up human bones with private money and not have to pay any attention. 
But a passerby noticed that gra that graves were being disturbed and destroyed by heavy construction construction equipment, and archaeologists did get involved. But they got involved because they imposed themselves on the uh, the contractor. And so volunteers under the direction of an anthropology professor from here are the volunteers digging like crazy from Rutgers Camden and the director of the Mutter Museum Research Institute were given a week to excavate what they could. I mean, look, there are burials coming up all over the place here. They didn't have time to record skeletons in place. So they taped the coffins to pallets uh, and they were removed to an old dog uh, grooming facility because it was a big warehouse that wasn't being used for dogs anymore, where they could be excavated by hand undercover. And it took a while. 78 sets of remains were removed this way. But when more burials showed up, the company AECOM was brought in to excavate them in the field. A total of 325 additional graves were excavated. The contractor came up with some money for that excavation. See, he did that contractor didn't have federal funds supporting his project, which is why he didn't have to do archaeology. So he had to produce money out of his own budget, which he hadn't planned for, because he didn't plan to, of course, dig where there had been a very early 18th century burial ground, one of the earliest. It was a um, Baptist, an early Baptist church. So Kimberly, um, the contractor came up with money, they did excavation, but there was no money for analysis. And Kimberly Moran, who was the Rutgers Camden uh, archaeologist, put together, has put together an amazing team of scientists from virtually all over the world who are doing the work for free. So they're doing it as part of their own research projects, but it isn't funded. So it's not like the projects that I did on other, uh, other um, sites where you had a chunk of money that was paying for the research. So in this case, that is not. So they have people from Penn working on parts of the collection, College of New Jersey, Monmouth University, the University of Tennessee, the University of Liverpool in the UK, and I'm probably missing some, to do detailed analyses, including things like DNA, tooth morphology, brain fragments. This is the first time that I have seen desiccated brain fragments inside skulls, and they were excavated from this site that was being chopped up by construction equipment. So it's really phenomenal that all of this has been recovered and that it's being analyzed in such an extremely serious way. So um, the skeletons are being analyzed at the College of New Jersey by under the direction of a man named Gerald Be Beatrice, who is that man right there. And they've also done a very detailed uh, study of the cough, cough and hardware at the College of New Jersey. This project is described in detail in the new book. It's one of the part of one of the new chapters. There are three new chapters added to the first edition to make the second edition. Unfortunately, finding burials during construction is not unusual. It is better to know about them beforehand though, and that is the case with another burial ground that is discussed in the book. A local historian came across a reference to a graveyard associated with the AME Church, now known as Mother Bethel, just before the city was about to renovate the Wakako, I never know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, playground in the 400 block of Queen and Catherine Street. So you can see this is on a 19th century map, but it didn't say, of course, on that map that it was associated with Mother Bethel. Uh, the, his, the local historian discovered that as he was doing archival research on another project. AECOM was brought in to do archaeological testing in, in this area, and this is Doug Mooney, who's a senior archaeologist for AECOM. These are the archaeologists working right in the site of and explaining to the interested public. So it's one of the very exciting things that we're doing more and more of, and especially Doug Mooney and the company AECOM, they really make this huge effort to be sure the interested community is aware of what's going on, is involved, can pose questions. It's terrific, it's terrific. And uh, this, is a, this is a good example. They figured out from this little bit of testing that there are probably thousands of burials below the Wakako playground, uh, between two and a half and four and a half feet below the surface, some probably much deeper. 
Fortunately, these burials did not have to be removed and were therefore not subjected to scientific um, study. So you see the archeologists can scrape each surface that is excavated, you know, you, you, we dig layer by layer. So we're looking for changes in the soil or changes in the texture or anything that lets us know that we might be encountering some new area of deposits. And so in this case, they they see that the underlying coffin outlines and because the playground was just being renovated, they didn't have to dig down deep. The coffins did not have to be excavated. They could just record that there were all these burials there sealed beneath, beneath, beneath this layer of dirt. However, so there's been no scientific study of the, of the bones because the bones never came out of the ground. <laughs> but a local historian whose name is Terry Buckalo, and he's the one who also discovered the existence of this burial ground, has done extensive research into the burial records. From that research, he is able to provide a picture of the free black community that belonged to the church in the middle decades of the 19th century including things like the square footage of the spaces that people were living in, their occupations, their education levels, where they were born and what they died from. It is an invaluable record that paints a picture of a hardworking population that endured unthinkable living conditions. And speaking of doing things for free, this historian is still laboring away at finding all of the burial records and then fleshing out the minimal information that's in each burial record with references to, there are a couple of African-American um, census records that date to the middle of the 19th century and every, you know, every other, the directories, everything. And you can go to his webpage, which is Bethel Burying Ground Project. And he continues to add to their, well, actually the last uh, entry I just checked this morning was June to 2023. I don't really know if he's continuing that. But anyway, it's an amazing, amazing description of the people who were living in this neighborhood who were, were associated with Mother Bethel in its years, it did for decades in the 19th century. Um, it's okay. Another of my project connects to Mother Bethel in a different kind of way. John Milner Associates, the company I worked for, um, did the archaeology for the Convention Center expansion project. You recognize PAFA here, I'm sure, so you know where you are on the ground. Between 13th and Broad Street and Arch and Ray Streets in 2007, my office was in a warehouse across the street. If I hadn't gotten this project, I really would have been unhappy because archaeologists, like engineers, we bid on projects and somebody gets them and somebody doesn't. So uh, since this was out the office window, it was important that we get it. It was very interesting. Uh, the project is described in the book, but I'm just going to tell you about one of the finds, which just connects us to Mother Bethel. And oh, well, it's two of the finds. Two, these two incredibly beautiful chamber pots decorated with the very unlikely images of American eagles. Now we contact, I mean, these are really, we haven't seen this decoration or this kind of chamber pot anywhere else. I mean, it was probably made in Europe because that's where most of the ceramics from this period came from. It wasn't made here. And so finely potted and finely decorated. Anyway, the question is, why would you know somebody have chamber pots um, decorated with American eagles, especially an African-American? So the person who lived here was an African-American barber named Josiah Eddy, came when he was quite young, eventually lived on this lot with his family. We learned that Eddie was a lay preacher at Mother Bethel, even though he was way up here, you know, on Broad Street, not on Broad Street, but on that block, and Mother Bethel was on the other side of town. But Josiah's older brother was also a minister and he was an ordained one. And I, I, so I thought maybe knowing something about the church, which this family was so involved in, might explain why the Eddies had chamber pots decorated with eagles. Richard Allen, oh here, this is the privy out of which the pots came. And this is the house where Josiah Eddie and his family lived. And that privy is under an extension to a house that was built later on Ray Street. And of course, this, this extension covered up the area where the privy was, which of course, you know, preserved it. So often these later construction things don't necessarily disturb 
what we get at when we do archaeology, and, and they do the contrary. They 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 preserve it. This was a tiny little lot, you know, very um, tough area to do excavation in, but we did it, and we got those fabulous pots. Richard Allen, the founder of the of Mother Bethel, talked a lot about the promise of the Declaration of Independence in the context of fighting for the abolition of slavery, and he often referred to George Washington and various other patri patriotic symbols. While we cannot be sure that the chamber pots are a reflection of Allen's philosophy, he had died before Eddie arrived in Philadelphia. Allen's ideas lived on in the church and it is not unreasonable to think that they continued to be influential. One of the things that I have loved about doing archeology span uh, in Philadelphia over more than 20 years has been learning about the city's past bit by bit connecting what we learned from one site to another. My favorite example comes from my first project in Philadelphia, which is discussed in detail in the original edition of the book, which of course is still there in the second edition of the book. Um, uh, this is the visitor center on the middle block of Independence Mall. This is me. And on my last, this, this, this uh, project, is connected to the Museum of the American Revolution site, which we did much later in time on Third Street. We started uh, excavating the site where the visitor center is built in 1999. The site, that is the impact area of the proposed building included three historic uh, properties. So this law that requires us to do the archeology span doesn't allow us to say, well, it'd be really nice to do general archeology span in this big area. You can only use the money to dig in the place where there's gonna be disturbance. So we can only dig where there were three historic properties that faced uh, Mark, Market Street and three historic properties that faced North Six. So we know that from researching the maps before we start to do an excavation. So we knew what the layouts of the properties were in the 18th and 19th centuries so that we could know where to look for possible what we call features like privies or wells or cisterns or or backyards uh, so we know where to look you can't dig the whole site and the city is you know so full of stuff that you can't take everything out of the ground either you have to be very um strategic about planning the excavation and planning where you're going to devote your energy and what is going to be worthwhile so one of these privies that we found a lot in North uh, 6th Street, which is the one that you see me in, and here's a close-up. And notice this privy was under a wall of a later building. So that later building, again, it preserved the 18th century privy because this building was built in the 19th century. So with heavy, we work with these heavy machine operators and they're terrific because they have such control of their machines and they can move big stuff that we need moved. So they can take this wall away so that we can actually dig into this priming. So it was brimming over with wine bottles and we suspected, look at those beauties. We suspected that um, it had been a tavern. But when we did the research, we learned that William Simmons, an accountant had lived there in the 1790s. He was the principal clerk in the auditor's office of the Department of Treasury. Alexander Hamilton would have been his boss and was later the chief accountant in the War Department. He was a rigid bureaucrat. He sounds like a deadly bore. I mean, I know that from letters that happened to be published in uh, Alexander Hamilton's published papers. So he was a, a rigid bureaucrat who played by the rules and was host to members of the first US Congress when it was in session. And I always imagine they were smoking these pipes in front of the fireplace, you know, when Congress was in session, they're all sitting around arguing about politics. Coincidentally, the auditor's office, and this is where the auditor, so William Simmons would have schlepped up from 6th Street to his office, which was on 3rd Street next to the first bank, which of course was Hamilton's bank. So um, it's pretty neat. This is a place marker, a, a historic you know, place marker. And this that's the way they mark sites within Independence National Historical Park. You probably all know that. So this ivy is planted inside a brick enclosure, which represents the building that used to be there that was 
William Simmons' office. So I love the idea of him coming to this office, especially since it's across from the Museum of the American Revolution. And this was the excavation that we did in the Museum of the American Revolution site in 2014. We found, among other things, interesting features, a couple of spectacular punch bowls. You may have seen this one if you've been to the museum. It's in the second room, lower right, I should point out to you. It was really a fantastic find. It found at the bottom of the privy, which I'm going to talk more about in a minute. And do you see success to the Trifena here? I have something blocky on my screen. The Trifena was a boat that um, we know from the local newspapers in the period that went back in 1760s, it went back and forth from Liverpool to Philadelphia. And most of the records of the ship, you know, come, what is the ship bringing, brought textiles from Liverpool. But one message was sent by the merchants of Philadelphia to the merchants of Britain asking them to stop the Stamp Act. Well, you know, we found this bowl on the site of the Museum of the American Revolution. Needless to say, the Stamp Act is relevant. So they were pretty thrilled that we found something that's so connected to their mission. But that's not the point of what I'm telling you about this. What I'm telling you about it is that the privy that that bowl came out of and various other things came out of. So this is how we actually, you can see there's the first bank across the street. And uh, this is how we excavate things in their urban situation, you cut them in half so that you're going to go down layer by layer and uh, keep the layers separate and keep the artifacts from the layers separate because they may represent different deposits. So you can see here is Catherine and she really is higher up than this, this shot, this, this um, photograph. And she's going down and she's coming down to the line, which was thrown in there to counter the smells and to, you know, to clean up the privy, especially when that they changed the residence, but if you, different people moved in, you usually threw a line in the, the old privy. So what we found in there, and this property belong, was, um, this property belonged to Benjamin and Mary Humphreys. They had moved there in 1776, and Mary at least was there until her death in 1822. Again, many wine models and tankards and regulation sizes led us to believe that the Humphreys had been running a tavern on the property. It didn't really lead me to believe that. I, the guy who analyzed the glass artifacts from this feature told me it had to have been a prevalent privy because he had a hundred glasses, I think, or a hundred bottles. And he was pretty sure that uh, it had been a tavern. I was reluctant to believes that Han that uh, Benjamin and Mary Humphreys, a nice Quaker couple who, you know, were going to meeting, we had, we could check all the records that went with them, that they would be running uh, what turned out to be an illegal tavern. So since we looked for a tavern license, which would have been uh, re required in those days, but we did find, some, we didn't find a tavern license, but we did find something else. And that is in eight, 1783, Mary Humphreys, here she is, is accused of keeping a disorderly house, a term that implied an unlicensed drinking establishment where prostitutes also plied their trade. Trade, Even though she was declared not guilty, she pleads not guilty, and she's declared not guilty. Mary is guilty of keeping a disorderly house where, uh, but that she is not guilty of the particulars charged. It's a little confusing. And then the judgment is very um, strict for being not guilty of the particular. She is committed to the jail of this city till Saturday week next. And then on the said day, she'd be carried carted through the city and that she'd be afterwards confined in the workhouse at hard labor for three months that she pay the cost of this prosecution and stand committed till this sentence is complied with. We don't know whether she actually complied with all of that, but we do know that she returned home and would have been living across the street from the auditor's office when William Simmons worked there. So I love to imagine them pa you know, each passing each other on the street and nodding good morning. <laughs> maybe, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But it sort of brings it alive. And it's so wonderfully coincident that we dug one thing in, it's, uh, what is it, 1999 and dug this one, uh, you know, much later. Finds on the museum site also connected a site that had been excavated many years before, also connected to a site that had been excavated many years. Ceramics, 
and these are gorgeous. These are posset pots. They were used, especially in taverns, for a drink called posset, which was curdled milk with alcohol in it. Yuck, sounds awful, right? But I guess it was something people like to drink. Uh, so we found, there were many, many, many of these. And we think that they were thrown in a privy, actually on the, across the street, but that's a whole story I'm not going to bother telling here. It's told in the book. Um, when the old uh, a three ton tavern was redecorated in the 1760s. So you see this up here, 1768. To be, this is an advertisement to rent the old three ton tavern, now the Fountain Inn and Chestnut Street, lately accommodated with a new room back. 40. In other words, there was a lot of disturbance to this property, and we think they probably threw out all the old dishes. And that's what we were looking at. Joseph Yates was the tavern keeper, and he employed an enslaved man named James Dexter, also known as James Orinoco Dexter, in 1767. And it's nice to know this because here's the places is for, for rent in 1768. In 1767, Sevens. First time I've really noticed this or thought about it. Yates contributed 50 pounds to the manumission of Dexter, in other words, to make him not a slave anymore, who himself contributed another 50 pounds. Dexter went on to work as a coachman. Let's see, I think I have the manumission record here. Yeah, yeah. Manumission of, of Negro Orinoco. And this talks about, you know, everything they did to pay for his, his freedom. Dexter went on to work as a coachman for John Pemberton, a wealthy Quaker merchant and traveling preacher. preacher. He lived in the Pemberton household part of the time, but by 1790, he was renting a house on Fifth Street. And the lot where that house was located was excavated in 2003 because it is where they were going to build the bus parking lot for the Constitution Center. So, you know, here's another connection. Here is Orinoco Dexter archaeological site. This is possible foundation, would have gone under Fifth Street, which has been substantially widened. And this feature had artifacts in it, which may have come from his household. Dexter had become, by that time, a leading member of the Free African Community and was a founding member of St. Thomas's African Episcopal Church. So Coxie Toogood is the historian who did the research that discovered Dexter had lived on Fifth Street, you know, speculated that, you know, maybe these artifacts were used when they had some kind of an organizational meeting for St. Tom Saint, um, Thomas's Church at Dexter's house. When they did the excavation on the lot where Dexter lived, they knew they had, that he had worked in a tavern as a young man, but they didn't know who he had worked for and what the circumstances of his manumission were. So again, we're just learning more by connecting these little bits that we picked up with different projects over time. I want to mention one more, con one more connection. Dr. David Jane, I hope this is, yes, there he is. No, I think I've distorted this slide. Uh, Dr. Day, who built um, what some people think was the first prototype skyscraper on the Museum of the American Revolution site. It was in the middle of the Chestnut Street street frontage. Um, we found its foundation and here, his foundation. That was really a very exciting find because when um, the Park Service was developing Independence National Historical Park, they took the old Jane building down, the one that was thought to be a prototype of skyscraper. And Charlie Peterson, who was the architect, uh, historical architect for the Park Service at the time, thought it was a huge mistake to take the building down because he thought it was such an important building. It was built in 1850. It was just, you know, technologically, it was a, a feat because it was such a high building uh, and they were able to build it. So um, when we found the foundation, that the foundation was still there, they may have taken the building down, but that foundation fought the good fight and was still in place. And I you know, wanted Charlie Peterson to be looking down and realizing that his, his building was still representing itself. Anyway, um, Dr. Jane, who and blah, 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 he called himself a doctor, but he probably wasn't one. He was a patent manufacturer, patent medicine manufacturer, and he published a journal about patent medicines and all sorts of stuff. One of the most, um, so he's probably not the only one who was 
a patent medicine manufacturer who was pretending to be a doctor doctor. One of the most dramatic things found on the Route 9, I-95 project, which is sort of north of Center City and is a highway project ongoing, been going for years. I don't remember how many years and it is still going. And there is a whole chapter about it in the book also. The subject um, are the remains of the diet glassworks. Let's see if I have those. Yeah, look, it's that fantastic. Uh, amazing. An extensive collection of buildings that incorporated early factories in the site into a huge complex. Now, this is the part that was excavated because it's the part that the project impacted. But the rest of it, this is an insurance map uh, one, with wonderful detail. You can see it's, it was really a big operation. Diet began as a boot black. He reinvented himself as a patent medicine manufacturer and eventually identified as Dr. Diet, doctor of physic and druggist. Beyond the factory, he supposedly developed a 300 acre farm for his workers, uh, uh, Yeah, built uh, houses for them to live in and also opened a bank. He was also a sort of egomaniac who manufactured hundreds of these, um, what are they called? The flasks that you can carry in your pocket with alcohol in them. And on one side of the flask was the image of Benjamin Franklin. And on the other side of the flask is the image of Diet himself. So they have many fragments of these from the excavation uh, of the site. And it's just interesting that he did that. They also have these wonderful things that are called whimsies, I think. Anyway, they would have been made by workers in the glass factory who, you know, were technically expert at working with glass. And these they might have just made in their, their off time or as presents or to show off how good they were at it. These, these are um, glass bottles that have been made into hats. And these are so beautiful. I really love them. So this guy was overextended and eventually went bankrupt and was sentenced to jail for three years at Eastern State Penitentiary, another site where we have done archaeology and is in the book. So here's Eastern State. You recognize that this is an old picture of when there was this tunnel. This was this uh, prison escape uh, through a tunnel that went under the wall. And here is where the prisoners, came, where, yeah, where the escapees came out. And we did an excavation next to the wall. We, it was easy to cut the blocks there. And we found there they had come out. And we also found we had been hired to determine whether the tunnel was still there. So we used ground penetrating radar in the yard that uh, would have been an area where the tunnel had to have passed because the tunnel started in a cell that was behind this wall that belonged to somebody named Clarence Kleindings. And then we did determine that the tunnel, you know, where the tunnel would be. And so we dug there and then we set a camera down to take pictures. And indeed, part of the, ar the, the arch of the tunnel is still standing. Obviously, you can't go down in it, and it was unsafe to go in in the first place. This was always talked about as the Willie Sutton escape tunnel. Uh, but it was really engineered and built and, and thought of by this guy named Clarence Kleindings, who lived in the cell on the other side of this wall. When I did this project, I can't even remember what year the project was done, um, they were still you know, giving Willie Sutton all the credit because it was a good publicity thing, because Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber, you'd like to associate your site with that. But now I understand they're giving Kleindings the credit, they're calling it Kleinies Tunnel. So I'm very glad to hear that because, you know, he deserved to get the credit. Needless to say, I've gone from archaeology in the city to archaeology of the city. That distinction was made a long time ago in a publication by my thesis advisor, Bert Sawin, and I don't really remember what he meant by it. I do know that what I do is of the city, of how people lived in Philadelphia's past, how that past relates to its present. Maybe Bert was talking about how archaeology reveals uh, infrastructure changes over time, but I have to believe that what really counts are the people. And in this talk, I've introduced you and a number of people who we've come to meet through archaeology who are otherwise unknown in history, but you know, flesh out the kind of daily lives that aren't necessarily described in your normal histories of Philadelphia. So it, it's, it's we, that we, we, and we also, 
meet people that we you wouldn't necessarily um, think of of trying to beat. And the, that's what's so wonderful about it, the serendipity of it, that you do research that the art, that the finds lead you to do, not necessarily the research that you would uh, do before you began the project. It's, it's different than when you have a hypothesis and you're trying to, you know, get, figure out whether or not it works or not. This is led by the finds and uh, it's very exciting and I have enjoyed a career in it. And I'm showing you one last gorgeous artifact that came from the same place that those posset pots came from. And it's made locally. We don't know by whom, but it's one of our prizes. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. This has been fascinating. I, 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 I'm I, sure everybody has been sitting here on the edge of their chair, just listening to these stories, the the richness that we, we have paper archives that tell some bits of the story, but the fact that these physical findings that are often thrown into latrines, <laughs> broken shards and putts, that they that they help illuminate and tell the interconnections between people um, in our city and, and help remind us that Philadelphia has always been, you know, a really a small place um, where we, we uh, interact with one another in so many ways. This has just been fascinating. Thank you. And I think it's, you know, you all remember, you're going to get an email after this event from Tess with the link on how to buy this book. Um, and I, I think this is probably has everybody wanting to read more. Right now, though, we have Rebecca here to answer questions um, that anybody has. Please um, put your questions. You can put them in the Q&A and you can put them in the chat. Uh, you're getting all the uh, all, the, all, the, all the kudos right now on, on, the, on the chat, but also if anybody has questions, um, please add them. Uh, Carolyn does note that Charles Peterson's niece, Karen, was her college roommate and is still a good friend. Oh, good. Um, so happy to help connect if you are. Um, since speaking of that, our, uh, we haven't been able to do our um, symposium in several years because of the pandemic, but we're having our symposium again uh, next month in November. Um, then Tess can put the, the link up. You can get some information there. We'll start selling tickets very soon, but it's looking at the 50 years of the historic architecture, uh, American building survey, um, which has been championed by, by Charles Peterson, start by, started by Charles Peterson and given awards to uh, celebrating the students the, who are receiving the awards this year for the, um, the Peterson Prize for their renderings of those historic American buildings. So I hope people will come. It's going to be a great symposium. But right now, thank you, Hillary. She says, I appreciate how you weaved primary sources into the presentation to tell these stories. Uh, Rebecca, she's wondering if you can talk about your research process for identifying, identifying those materials when you find artifacts at a site. For identifying the artifacts? Or I, we use everything. I'm glad you appreciated that we're using primary documents as we're not, we're not just dealing with the stuff. You have to deal with the stuff in the context. We also use secondary sources. You know, you have to read a lot of history to know what's relevant to think about, what's relevant to spend time thinking about. So I don't quite know what your question is. We use the archives, we use directories, we use deeds, We or do you mean... How do we uh, how do we analyze the actual things? The things we have specialists. So you know, I had somebody who knew more about ceramics than I did. I have somebody who knows know more about glass than I do, and they uh, somebody who knows about seeds that we get out of the uh, privies. You know, you get seeds from the night soil, which is human waste, and you can identify the seeds. So you bring all of this data together, that the physical data and the documentary data in order to say as much as you can possibly say about that place. So um, am I answering the question? I'm not quite sure. Hillary, if you want you, you're, oh, she's, she's wondering about which institutions you've used, how you go about locating sources. Oh, which institutions? Oh, well. Like if uh, you, so you, find, you find a pot and how, where, where, how do you figure out, well, where do I need to go? Which archives do I need to go to, to find out more? Right. Well, so the ceramics uh, expert who I worked with at John Milner Associates, 
was very interested in all the potters. And so she did research into the local potters, Pennsylvania potters, Moravian potters. So it's she didn't go, she had a broader knowledge. You wouldn't just go to one uh, repository for that kind of information. When, for instance, with Miss, for the tavern license. So to go to the, for, find out whether the uh, Humphreys had a tavern license or not. I went to the Historical Society, but Todd Benedict went to the archives and he, it was he who found the notice that Mary Humphreys had been arrested. So you, we go everywhere. <laughs> we every, everywhere that conceivably might help us figure it out. We go to the Free Library because the Free Library had a terrific historic map. So you have to look at all the historic maps for every site, especially before you even begin exploring the site because you want to know what you could anticipate what might be there what was there before how many uh, you know different overlying things were there before so um every yeah you know, just every place every place you can think of every place pen obviously the special collections at pen where did i go for the special i can't remember what i research oh and then with William Simmons my favorite person member of the bureaucrat in the 1790s I love him I was looking at I was at the Penn Library and I was looking for something else I don't remember what but uh, Alexander Hamilton's papers were there so I actually just looked in the index for Simmons name I had no idea and he's just an accountant right why would his name be in the index turned out that the letter that Alexander Hamilton wrote to recommend William Simmons for his job at the War Department is in the published papers of Alexander Hamilton. So amazing. I mean, what an amazing thing. And then there are also these letters that Simmons himself wrote that, uh, you know, that reveal his his uh, personality, which I don't think was fun. <laughs> I'm certainly glad to have uh, met him at a distance. Uh, so it, the answer is everything, everything, everywhere. It takes a lot, you say, it takes a lot of just being willing to take a stab in the dark sometimes to try to try to see what you can find um, on, uh, on items and say, um, I'm going to check this book and see if there's something here. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you, you just pursue it, pursue it, pursue it until you're satisfied that you've found out everything you can find out. I do write these narrative vignettes and there are a couple in the books. So I weave together everything we know about, for instance, there's a narrative vignette about William Simmons. So I, I quote from the letters and then I include an interpretation of the artifacts that tell us, you know, what he, how he was living while he was thinking these thoughts that are revealed in the letters. So, you know, we try to um, weave everything together that we can to get the clearest picture of what we do know. And it also tells us what we don't know, which is extremely valuable. So, you know, I don't do just write those narrative vignettes for entertaining the public. I write those narrative vignettes to figure out what we know and what we don't know. Yeah, you know, you can write, you can describe all the ceramics and the numbers and do statistics. That just doesn't do it for me. I have to get the people to come to life. Well, thank you. Um, we're getting a bunch of questions coming in. Jackie wonders what happens to the artifact, artifacts that you find. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Usually uh, they go to Harrisburg and they're in the bowels of the you know, storage department. But and there isn't really room for all the collections that have been excavated under these laws. And uh, but you can't just throw the stuff out. At the Museum of the American Revolution, they are curating the collection. This is so wonderful. It is so unusual. I am so ecstatic that they have taken it on. They haven't, didn't take on the whole collection, but they took on the connection that relates to the, the Museum of the American Revolution. And it's not that they're displaying it. They're not displaying it, but they're working on it. There are people learning to do uh, conservation on various pieces. And they will incorporate objects in besides the one uh, punch ball I showed you, they will probably be incorporated. And they're using some of the objects in the education department down in the basement, and they have terrific educational program. So they, um, and they're using our report, you know, we wrote a big fat technical report about the Museum of the American Revolution site, and they use it regularly, which, you know, warms my heart, <laughs> really, because they, of all of our clients, 
have really incorporated our finds into the museum. And when I you know, got tears in my eyes, when I heard that they were really using my report so regularly, um, the answer from one of their curators was, well, yes, it's part of our story. Well, yeah, wow. The archaeology should be part of lots of clients' stories, but they don't make it part. They just say, you know, get out of our way as fast as you can and and do do right by the artifacts, you know, meet the requirements of the law and send them to Harrisburg and put them in the basement. <laughs> so, so. So, um I have a couple questions. This one came in through on the Q&A first from John, uh, wondering if you uh, dug at the National Constitution Center site, and if so, what became of the findings? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that one. I bid on that site, and I didn't get it. So there's an example of a project I didn't get. Uh, they excavated, I didn't work on the site. They excavated a huge amount of stuff and they excavated so much stuff that they have not finished the analysis and there's no report. No report. Oh, so Correct. We'll, we'll, we'll keep, <laughs> keep waiting and hoping. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Matt, Matt wonders if you have thoughts on what we can do as citizens to help raise awareness of the archeological opportunities that are in the city and to lobby developers to put in even a little bit of work? Uh, well, we do need an ordinance because they have an ordinance in New York, they have an ordinance of Alexandria, Virginia. You know, there are city ordinances in other cities which require archeology span in places that are deemed sensitive by you know, this staff that would know that sort of thing in, in that city. It just hasn't happened here in Philadelphia. It seems extraordinary, but it hasn't happened. I think that the articles that Stephen Sal Salisbury and others have written for the Inquirer have made people aware of archaeology. And when we're in the field, people are hanging over the sites and you know, are hanging over the fence and excited by archaeology. But somehow it doesn't get translated into any kind of political pressure or enough political pressure for the Historical Commission, for instance, to hire an archeologist, which has only been true in the 1980s. So there's no archeologist at the Historical Commission watching over you know, what might be disturbed and what might be significant. We all, when we bid on these projects, we, we're sort of doing our own assessment. We're, we're seeing, we're doing the research that allows us to know what's significant. It's really too bad. And when there was an archaeologist at the Historical Commission, they did the Hertz lot, which was terrific. Uh, water, you know, it's it's by, um, it was an old wharf, it was old boat yards, and more has been done there recently. And the more is also reported in the book. And the, the original excavation reported in the book too. So it's, it's um, I don't know, you can, you can enthuse. And if you know anybody with power and, um, inside, talk about how it would be great if there were a private ordinance, you know, an ordinance that that um, affected projects that were were only uh, funded by private money. People are sensitive about that. that they don't want to, you know, have you require them to dig up their property <laughs> or to use their money. It's it's a it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. So it sounds like starting with our, our city council members and um, having sure. conversations with them, getting some good advocates. Sure. Um, that was great, great question, Matt. Thank you. Um, so Lily um, is wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience as a woman in archaeology, given the still prevalent stereotype of an archaeologist as a rough, dirty Indiana Jones kind of man. I always worry that I'll dis disappoint people, you know, when I, when I arrive. In <laughs> Truth be known, urban archaeology, at least in the Northeast, is dominated by women. And women, uh, you know, we just, there are a lot of us. There are a lot of us. And we, a lot of us have done a lot of publishing, a lot of thinking about this stuff. Uh, so it's, it. we have not been kept out of this nice, dirty field. Or, you know, Indiana Jones hasn't preventing that, hasn't prevented that, prevented us from succeeding in the discipline. We've done fine and there's plenty of room for women. And if you're willing to get dirty, you know, the thing I love about doing archeology span is that it's physical and intellectual. I love being in the dirt. I love getting dirty. And then 
you know, taking the stuff inside and figuring out what it means. It's such a combination of, of knowledge and, and uh, interpretive activity. It's so, it's so, so fun, so fun. So it's not, uh, it's really not a problem. I mean, even though sometimes I am self-conscious that somebody would rather I uh, looked like Indiana Jones than look like an old lady with a hard hat on. Uh, but, you know, so be it. I had a wonderful experience in the Museum of the American Revolution site. I was on the site in my usual digging clothes and one of the construction workers put out his hand. He was going to help me down. And then he realized, oh, no, you, <laughs> you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to treat me like a lady. You're supposed to just treat me like an archaeologist, like everybody else. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So Carolyn Klebser is sharing some great information, links back to the Athenaeum and, and on our own um, our own collections and, and work that we do. If you're interested in learning more about burial sites and the stories of people and finding those cross connections, um, she points out Phila Geo History, which is hosted on the philaathenaeum.org website. Um, it includes ancient burial sites. Uh, she's also been working with the philadelphiacongregations.org project. And so you can go to that website, um, which was part of a huge grant. Um, project that the Athenaeum also participated in digitizing all the records of historic congregations in Philadelphia, where you can find a lot of uh, information about burial sites. That's um, great. So yeah, that's great. Incidentally, in the new book, there is a burial map, which has been put together by somebody named Kim Morell, who has, has done um, the excavations on many burial sites within the city of Philadelphia. And she has made a map to show where these burial grounds are located throughout the city so that when developers are looking at a new lot to develop, you know, they will avoid it if they know that there, there's a burial ground that they might run into there. Because it's very expensive, all of this stuff, digging burials, you know, and, and sensitive, you know, it's sensitive to be digging up people's uh, resting places. So this map does exist. I don't know if that's in the Athenaeum archives or not. It's on the Philadelphia Archaeological Forum website, and it's interactive. You can go in and get the information on each of these places that's indicated as a burial ground. And it's so, that so interesting that the burial grounds, of course, within the city are interspersed. I mean, people buried their dead where they lived. You know, it wasn't scary to live next to a, a little burial ground. And I, I like that. I like you get the feeling of that the burial grounds were part of communities. I think that helps answer, you know, uh, uh, Amy had wondered why the the uh, the Mother Bethel burial ground underneath the, the playground was left where it was. And as you say, that the urge is if you don't need to disturb, leave them there. They were intentionally Absolutely. buried there. Absolutely. Uh, they are, um, they've been, they've already, already have identification in that burial site. It's not a, like a potter's grave where you're trying to find out information about who the people are. So um, yeah. yeah, that is wonderful. There was one last question and um, those lovely chamber pots that you found, um, Meg is wondering where they may be now. Are they on view anywhere? Where are they? Um, God, the ones with the eagles. I, of course, I know what the beautiful chamber pots that you're talking about. Yes. I fear. I fear that they are in Harrisburg because they were part of the convention center expansion site. And um, that collection, you know, was not taken by the convention center. Uh, I fear that they're an example of things that are not, you know, I mean, you could go and look at that collection because all those collections are, are labeled, but goodness only knows. I mean, Oh. I think the Museum of the American Revolution is jumping on that already and is on the phone to say, hey, what do we need to do to get those on display in our collection? <laughs> so, uh, it doesn't relate um, to their specific mission, unfortunately, but it no. would be nice. <laughs> it would be nice. And there's such uh, a new box there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It is one o'clock and this has been wonderful. Rebecca, thank you for helping us uh, initiate again our lung, lung, lunchtime lunches. This has been an incredibly insightful, interesting um, and engaging time with you and um, invite you back anytime. And okay. if you haven't, we have 
We have the book here at the Athenaeum, but I hope you will also buy yourselves a copy so you can pour over it and make notes in the margins um, and um, give copies to people you love who would also have an interest in Philadelphia's history and archaeology and how it all ties together. Welcome you again. Thank you, Rebecca, and hope everybody has a very wonderful afternoon. Thank you and very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Be Rebecca, before you jump off, you might want to just scroll through the chat to see all the all the people sending you shout outs. So oh, um, here. oh look at that. 61. Okay, thank you. All these thank yous. Yeah, since you can't see people, it's nice to see the um <laughs> so that they were here. Yeah, nice to catch the love. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know how to go further here. This is maybe this is it. Oh, this is it. I see it was all the way down. Okay. Okay. 103 Callahill Street and started a podcast called The Boghouse, talking all about that. Now, I hope they dug it stratigraphically. Mudlarking on the Thames. Yes, of course it counts. I, my son lives on Inwood Hill Park in Manhattan. Huh. <laughs> we have to ask for the summer. Helping to clean and cattle and plant is USS Cairo. Peterson's niece. Well, this is very nice. Ordered your book. Good. Yeah, there are a few people who said that here. I hope so. And around us to think that we walk just a small distance. I walked by the water department doing some work. Absolutely. Well, these are surely appreciators. Thank you again. Thank nice you. Time. Have a wonderful okay. afternoon, Rebecca. This is wonderful. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh, there we are. <laughs> now, how do I get out of here? Hmm. I'll, I'll close it. <laughs>